All right. Well, if you have a Bible, go ahead and grab them and open them to Romans chapter 2. That's where we're going to be. Uh, so we've been going through the book of Romans since we started this school year. And uh, we've really gone through quite a few different topics already. So we started off by just Paul addressing uh, them and saying how proud he was of the church that's there in Rome, uh, really because the church that was there, uh, news about them had spread throughout the ancient world, which more likely meant just the Roman Empire. Uh, because, and, and then he talked about how he was not ashamed of the gospel because it was the power of God for salvation. But then he goes on and talks about unbelief and how people that didn't believe that, that it's not because there's not enough evidence. God's made himself known. He's made himself crystal clear. The problem is people suppress the truth and then they pervert and twist the truth and then they live outside of that truth. And when you do those things... Uh, we looked the next week about what happened. It says God gave them over to a depraved mind and abandoned them and said, kind of, fine, you want to live that way, do it. And they did things that were not natural to humans. And it specifically addressed the hot topic nowadays of homosexuality, saying men are with men and women are women doing things that are indecent and immoral, and now they are receiving the reward for their penalty or the uh, they're getting kind of what they deserve for living outside or completely contrary to God's intention and his creation. And we saw how some of the things that, that take place there in that community, we saw that, how it's clearly explained in the Bible, and you can see how that takes place in our society. But then we got to chapter 2, and Paul kind of flipped it and said, and quit talking about them and those who do this, and said, but who are you, O oh man? to judge. And he puts it on the people he's writing to. Keep in mind, he's writing this to a group of Christians that are in Rome. More than likely, these were all Jewish people. We'll get there tonight. We'll see that. But he's saying, you think you're good to go because it's just those people that live this way. However, last week we kind of talked about a story about David and the prophet Nathan, where Nathan tells him a story about something wicked that happened. And David says, yeah, that guy's wicked for doing that. Uh, he should be damned for what he did. And Nathan looks at him and says, well, you are that man. You have done wicked. And Paul, likewise, at the beginning of chapter 2, says, that's you. You have the same sin problem that they have. We're all in this kind of together. Well, tonight, we're going to kind of dig into some of that and look at a few particular aspects of the people that God is writing to. Um, but first, you know, there's a passage, and I've told you all this before, but... Uh, I've always said this was the most frightening passage in all of Scripture. And it's found in Matthew chapter 7. Um, Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23. Y'all listen to what Jesus writes and uh, what Jesus says in those verses. He says, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, the reason I say that passage is frightening, let me highlight a few points of this passage. Not our passage for tonight, but it's closely related. Uh, he says, on that day, many will say to me. He doesn't say, there's a chance that someone will come to me one day. He doesn't say, it may be likely that some will come to me. Instead, so it's not that it's possible, but rather it's probable or that it's a guaranteed fact. He says, many will come to me. Not a few, many will come to me on that day. And what are they going to say? Lord, Lord. They're going to call him Lord and repeat it. They're going to look at him and say, Lord, Lord calling out to him, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name? In other words, they did a lot of really good, you could say, Christian things. Didn't we do all this in your name? And Jesus' response to them is, I never knew you. Now, I think that's very important, and, and I'm not trying to preach a message on just this passage, but notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, I knew you, but you sinned. He doesn't say, I knew you, but you're a backslider. Or you went back on me. He says, I never knew you. And then he says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. 
Here's why that scares me. My fear as a youth pastor, uh, we come here, we meet on a weekly basis, multiple times a week. I get to interact with you. We get to go to Blue Bayou together. We get to go to Kentucky to youth camp together. We get to spend time playing ping pong, hanging out in here, doing silly games. We spend a lot of time around each other for quite a few years. Many of you start, you're just in middle school and you work your way up. Next thing you know, you're a high schooler and then you're driving and going to prom and then you're getting ready for college, you graduate and move on. And all that time that we spend together and that I pour into you, my fear is that some of you will leave this youth ministry and one day fulfill what Jesus spoke where he said, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did I not go to Thrive Student Ministries? Did I not go to Crossings? Did I not go to Jay Creek? Did I not do POIs and, and do fall retreat at Bogachitta? Did I not do all these things? Did I not sit through 150 sermons from Pastor Brian on Wednesday nights? Or did I not play in the praise team? And he will declare, depart from me, I never knew you. That's a real fear that I have. Because I don't want that for any of you. I don't want that for anyone. I mean, think about how terrible that would be. But God's word is God's holy inspired word. He says, many will come to me on that day. Those many are coming from somewhere these aren't unchurched people. These are people specifically in the church doing Christian things that he says that to. And so tonight, our passage in, in Romans, I think, is going to highlight that. And so we're going to talk tonight about the fooled and the fake is what we're going to look at, those who are fooled and those who are fake. So y'all look at uh, Romans chapter 2. We're going to start by just looking at verses 17 and 18. Romans 2, verses 17 and 18. This is what Paul writes. He says, But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. Now, I know this is not going to read super smooth because Paul, uh, just some cultural and language differences, he goes on for a really long time with these thoughts and sentences. I, I just can't in-depth cover things in that big of a chunk. So, we're stopping. I know there's no period at the end of that phrase, but he gives us a list here in these first two verses we're looking at tonight. And this is what he's addressing them with. He's talking to the Christians that are there in Rome, this church at Rome, who obviously from our text are made up of Jewish people who in their mind they've got it together. They're not the people in Matthew 7 where it says many will come to me, right? They're, they're good with the Lord. They're all saved. They're believers. They follow Christ. They're of Jewish background, so their roots go deep. Think about what he says there at the beginning. But if you call yourself a Jew, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament and kind of the storyline leading up to the time of Jesus, the Jews were God's chosen people. That's what they are. All through the Old Testament, they were chosen by God. Out of all the people on the earth, he went to a man named Abram and said, you're going to be the father of many people. You're going to have a whole lot of people come after you. A whole nation is going to come from you. You see different words that maybe will confuse you. Sometimes they're called the Israelites. Sometimes they're called Hebrews. That's the same thing. That's the Jewish people. All right? Those were God's chosen people. Now we see, even way back in the Old Testament, you can read how the purpose was not to limit it and say just Jews, but you're my chosen people. This is where my son, Jesus, will come through this line of people. You're special you're set apart, but you're set apart so that you can go tell others about me. A lot of people think that's a New Testament thing. That's in the Old Testament that he tells the Jewish people, your job is to go out to get the others, to reach the world, that the world may be blessed through you, through this Jewish people. So a lot of them took pride in that. They're like, I'm God's chosen people. I'm a Jew. That's an incredible thing. I'm set apart. I'm holy. Not only that, it says you call yourself a Jew, but secondly, and rely on the law. They were the ones that had God's law. In other words, we would call that the Old Testament. They had the word of God. It was given specifically to them. God went to his people and gave them his word through his prophets. So they had God's word. They're like, we're the ones who hold the literal messages from God. We have his word. And not just that, the third thing. It says they were a Jew. You call yourself a Jew, you rely on the law and boast in God. They boasted in God. 
Look what God did for us. Look what God's done for me. Look what all the Lord has done and how he's blessed us as a nation, as a group of people. Then it says, they call themselves a Jew, rely on the law, they boast in God, and they know his will. They knew the, the overall plan that God had. They understood it, they knew it, because they had his word. They were the special people, so they knew his will. And then it says, they approve what is excellent. In other words, they had the better judgment on morality. They know what's really excellent and not excellent. Keep in mind what we talked about two weeks ago when they were all dealing with homosexuality. He said, these people suppress the truth of God, therefore they end up in all of this sexual immorality and mess of life. We're better. We have better moral, a better moral compass. We understand things better because we approve what's excellent. And then he says, because you are instructed from the law. So they got their instruction specifically from God. All of these things were reasons that a lot of these Jewish people were completely fooled with their standing before God. And I think it's easy for us, as we said, to read about this in Romans, knowing that Paul wrote this, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that he wrote this to a group of people a couple thousand years ago, a church that was in Rome, and think, yeah, they were misled. However, let's take a little more modernized version of this, because I think one thing we could all agree on, this was a church made up of, of Jewish people, clearly from our text, that are followers of Christ. We also are followers of Christ. We are a church. We're a body of believers who follow Christ. Let's see if any of this fits with us and where we may find ourselves standing. We call ourselves, instead of a Jew, a Christian. We hang our hat on that. Look, you can take polls, especially in our geographical region, and it's amazing how many people will mark and say, yep, I'm a Christian. Now, if you go to probe them on that, well, my grandma went to church. She was Baptist or Methodist, something like that. I don't know. And so they just say, I'm a Christian. If you go to take a survey, everybody that just says, well, I believe God exists, so yeah, I'm a Christian. Everybody down here claims to be a Christian. It's common. It's popular. You're almost the outcast if you don't claim to be a Christian in a lot of ways down in the Bible belt. Everybody claims that like it's a badge of honor. It's a good thing. I'm a good person. Uh, you ever hear these things where people say, well, look, I'm a man of God. I don't do this or that. And you're thinking, man, you haven't darkened the door of a church probably in decades. But yet they will claim to be a Christian. We do just like the Jews did. Knowing his word. You rely on his word. We, we all know it. How many people do you know that are kind of like, yeah, yeah, I know about Christianity. I know the story of Noah and the flood. I know about Jonah and the whale. I know about Jesus and the disciples. I, I, I went to Bible school as a kid. My grandmother, she read her Bible all the time. She would tell me stories. We all are familiar to some degree. Most Christians all know at least a couple Bible verses Probably John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world. We all learned that as a kid. A lot of people know it. And so they rely on the call. Like, yeah, I know God's word. I know what the Bible teaches as a whole. Like, I get it. Yeah, I believe, I believe all that. I know it. I believe it. Even a lot of non-believers, they say, well, the Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. They can pull some verse out. We have a familiarity in this country with God's word. And so we say, yeah, well, I know God's word. I've got it right here. We brag on God if things are going well despite our sin. How many times do you see somebody, I don't know how many times I've seen somebody that's living not a godly life, a very immoral life, and if something good happens, they're like, man, God's good to me. God's been good to me. He's treating me good. And I'm thinking, nah, no, I don't think. Don't be boasting about God when you're living a completely immoral, sinful lifestyle. It rains and the sun shines on the just and the unjust, but we will all stand before our maker one day. But we find ourselves bragging on God just like they did. We know what God wants. You know, we talked about them, how it says that, that uh, they approve what's excellent. We do the same thing down here. People will throw a fit about, about yes, I'm glad the, the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Make abortion illegal. You can't kill a baby. I'm sorry that you got pregnant and you didn't want to. There's other ways to prevent that. It's called quit sleeping with someone you're not married to. 
That's the, that's the guarantee. There's a 100% success rate that you will not get pregnant if you don't sleep with someone that you're not married to. And when you're married, you have kids. You plan your pregnancies. We fight for things like pro-life. How many people fight for pro-life that claim to be a Christian? There is tons of people. The church, especially in this area of the country, threw a fit with the Obergefell decision. If y'all don't know what I'm talking about, a few years ago, it was huge news when a Supreme Court said that our Constitution gives people the right of the same sex to be married. Now, I don't care if you're for it or against it. The Constitution says zero about that. It just doesn't even address it. That was not a thing back then when it was written. So it's really silly that you could even go either way with that, but we've become so polarized in this country that we will start a gajillion debates about things like this, and, and especially us, because we know we have the moral high ground. We're the right ones, right? We're the correct ones. We're the ones who have the proper view, the godly view, because we have instruction. Think about it. That's the whole list that Paul just gave them. You could literally take every one of those things and see how they fit perfectly with us, and now you see where we can sit right here and be fooled just like the Jews, the Jewish Christians in Rome that Paul was writing to. We can be fooled just like they are. We can stand for all these things and yet still be completely fooled. Think about how blessed we are. You ever stop and think about that? I think about it all the time as Christians. I mean, you can get a, an app on your phone or an iPad or something, and you could literally look up 15 different translations all in the English language, of the Bible and compare them and put them side by side. You can get on online with any, any kind of device and you can look up commentaries. You can look up Greek word studies, Hebrew word studies. You can go, there's a RTS, a Reformed Theological Seminary. Years ago, I downloaded their app. You know why? This is a, this is a grad school, this is a seminary, and, and they put everything on a mobile app to where I was able to go through and I would download all the lectures for every class they taught at the seminary grad school level and listen to them. And it tells you what books they're using. You can buy the books. You can read the book. You can it's like a, a cheap poor man's way. That was my way of trying to educate myself theologically. But I could sit at work and listen to that all day and then go home and read these books. And, and, and it costs zero other than buying the book. Like we've got just an embarrassment of riches. We have at our fingertips the ability to know so much about God's Word. Churches all over the place. We're not persecuted for going to them. If you don't like the music here, you go to that church. If you don't like the youth group here, you go to that other church with this other youth group. There, there's options all over the place. Yet, many of us are fooled because we rely on these things in this list just like these Jews in Rome did. Let's look at the next couple verses, 19 through 20. Paul writes and he tells them, And if you're sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. Notice what he says there, I, I, especially at the very beginning. I think this is key to that whole two verses we just read. The first couple words. And if you are sure. In other words, these people were confident. They were extremely confident that they were what? He goes through another list. A guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, and having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. He's saying you're sure all of these things about yourself. It's just like who we read about in Matthew 7. Many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, look what I've done. Paul here tells them, you are sure of all these things. Uh, I know I've used this, I've probably mentioned this quite a few times, but I like, we, my family loves to go to the Smoky Mountains. And so uh, we go every year, we'll... Years ago is when we first decided we were really, me and Miss Rachel, kind of wanting to start doing a lot more hiking. And so we go, and the kids are all a lot smaller. Back then, this was years ago, and so uh, we decided to hike. There's a trail at the back of Cades Cove, the Loop Road, uh, if you've been, anyways. You go to the back of the Loop, and there's this trail called Abrams Falls. 
Now, what's neat, you hike through the mountains to a waterfall, and it's like 5.2 miles, I think, or something hike. But you hike through mountains, some really cool views and stuff. But when you get to the end, it's Abrams Falls. It's Abrams Creek, and there's a big waterfall, and it's a huge swimming hole at the bottom. So what a lot of people do is you throw some sandwiches, chips, and stuff like that in the backpack, and you hike there, and then you go play in the water. And it, I don't care if you're going in the middle of July. It is freezing, ice-cold, crystal-clear mountain water. But you go swim, and it's a, it's a really cool thing. Uh, eat your sandwich and all that, and then you hike back. Hike down there in swimming trunks. You, know, you take shoes off, and you get in the water, and you can get out draw off a little bit, put shoes on, you hike all the way back to your vehicle. Well, we decided to do that hike, but y'all know my kids as a junior in high school and an eighth grader and a sixth grader. Chatty wasn't born yet. At the time, they were little. Taylor was the size of Chatty, so she was probably two, three years old, something like that. Cole's five years old or so. Braden's probably seven at the oldest, and we hiked back there. Well, I had one of those backpacks that you put the baby in the back, that right on your back, you know? So... I'm hiking, and I'm toting Taylor on my back back there. So we hike all the way there, spend our time there. Well, we start coming back, and we're already exhausted because we've already been all the way back there, swam, took care of kids, did all that, and now we're coming back, and it started setting in that I'm exhausted. I mean, like, I'm done. I'm wore out. I'm sopping wet, not with water from the creek, but sweating. Like, I'm burning up because not just do I have another human being on my back, but... I'm having to tote my own weight, and I'm going up mountains like this. And, and, and like, I sweat easy anyway. When you stick a little 98-degree human being on your back, you, you really, really sweat. And so I'm dripping. I'm blood red, and Cole is throwing a fit. My legs are tired. What do you expect a 5-year-old to do? He's throwing a fit. I can't walk. I can't do it. Well, y'all know my wife. She's every bit of, like, you know, little. And so she can't tote a whole lot, and I'm thinking, Oh, my gosh. So I kind of looked at her. I said, you and Braden, you walk slow. He's young. You're short. Y'all go slow. And I grabbed Cole, and I held him on my front like this. And he put his head down fell asleep. And Taylor was on my back, and I said, I'm gone. And I started going down that mountain, like, fast as I could safely without falling off, just cruising, hiking my way down. People, people would see me coming, and like, oh, my God. I must have looked like death because they would just get out the way and, like, come on, come on through, you know. And I'll come, and y'all, I was so tired when I got, finally got to the vehicle. I had that strap all buckled in, and Taylor strapped and buckled in. You need someone else to help you. I finally got to the vehicle, and I just hit my knees on, in the grass beside it, and I kind of laid Cole over, and I was just sitting there. I mean, exhausted, like, like splotchy skin color, like I was about to be overheated. My head was hurting, and this older lady come walking over and said, oh, my God, sir, I'm, I'm you look terrible. Let me help you with your baby. And she helped get Taylor off my back. And I just laid there. I laid the kids in the grass. And I just laid in the grass. And we waited until Rachel and Braden finally made their way down. Look, my point is, it was miserable. And it was miserable for me. I paid the consequences because I was overconfident. I thought, if yeah, I can hike five miles through the mountains carrying two little human beings, what could go wrong, Right? I bit off more than I could chew. I was so overconfident that I just took off back there. I should have prepped myself. If I'm really going to hike through the mountains, knowing I'm going to have to carry a bunch of little kids, you know what would probably be a good idea? Start jogging a, a month or two before my vacation. Maybe try and shed a few pounds. Maybe get in a little better shape if I'm going to hike up and down mountains carrying other people like I'm some kind of Navy SEAL or something. You know, Maybe I should have done but I didn't. I was overconfident. And I paid the price for it. These people were overconfident in what they were doing. They're saying, I'm a Jew. I've got God's word. I'm good. And us here, my fear is that you will say, I'm a Christian. I've been going to thrive. I'm good. I have nothing to worry about. But Paul warns them not to be fooled. He goes on. I want to read a story. Uh, Before we go further in there, actually, I want to read Luke chapter 18. Because I think when we think about the many On that day, will say to me, Lord, Lord, we think, well, surely that can't be talking about me. Listen to what he says here. Luke 18, uh, Jesus tells a a little parable. Uh, In verse 9, look what he says. He says, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. He said, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed this, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. 
I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts, who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus says you got a man who's thought of to be a religious person and another man who's a sinful person person according to the world however this religious person notice how it started trusted in themselves that they were righteous he trusted in his own righteousness that's where the other guy says i can't even look to god i know that i'm a sinner i know i've done wrong we need to have more of that view i realize i'm a sinner not yeah look at me i go to camp i go to thrive i go to d nows i go to youth rallies clearly i'm good don't be overconfident and fool yourselves. And notice what he says, 21 through 24. Let's read in Romans 2, 21 through 24. Paul says, You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say uh, that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So they were so fooled by their own righteousness, they did the very things that they were teaching against. Do y'all catch that in that text? You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? He's like saying, you claim to be a Christian, do you not actually practice what you preach? That's what he's getting at with them. And so he poses all these hypothetical questions that insinuate they were not living out what they actually believed. Not every Jew committed every single sin mentioned there. The point is, you're not practicing what you even preach and claim to believe. You're fooled and you're a fake. Not just were some of them fooled, but they were completely fake. Now we think about what it, is, it says that the Gentiles broke the law. You think about what it said earlier that God's law is written on their hearts. Well, the Jews are the ones that actually had his law written here. And, and, and you could say it's like Paul's way of saying the Gentiles have broke the law that God put on their heart and you've broke the very literal law that I gave you. You're living against that law. And it causes God's name to be blasphemed among the Gentiles because of the way they live. The very thing they claim to cherish and honor. Y'all realize they wouldn't even speak the name Yahweh? No one was allowed to even say it. It was such a sacred, holy name. You couldn't even say God's proper name. We're not allowed to even speak it, but yet the way they lived their lives dishonored that name. And so they were not just fooled, but they were fake. And look what it says in verse 25. He says, for circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes, becomes uncircumcision. Now, I'm not going into grave detail on what circumcision is. If you don't know, go home and ask your parents. But it's a way that didn't exist. No one was circumcised. It's a way that males can be uh, uh, marked to stand out as different. Now, we understand now, scientifically, there are actually quite a few health benefits to it as well, which I don't think is coincidental. But back in the Bible times, uh, only God's chosen people were circumcised. No one else on the planet was. That was how they were marked and stood out. Now, today, how are Christians marked? What do we do that helps us stand out to show who we are? This is in a new covenant, and it's a better covenant, God's Word tells us. We go through baptism. That's kind of the sign to mark out Christians now. It's better than circumcision, one, because everybody can be baptized. Girls, you can't be circumcised. Again, if you do not understand what I'm talking about, go home and ask your mamas. They would love to explain it, I'm sure. But this is God, this is Paul saying, you claim, he says circumcision does have value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, even your circumcision becomes like uncircumcision. And so this circumcision was an outward sign that pointed to an inward change that they had. Just like baptism, right? 
Baptism doesn't save us. It doesn't do anything like that. It's an outward sign, something we do to show the change that's already taken place on the inside. Think of it this way. Being circumcised or being baptized to where people on the outside see the change without living it is no different than someone who is an active adulterer. Someone who's cheating on their spouse, walking around saying, look at my ring, this is my wedding ring, y'all like it? My wife gave this to me when we got married. That's what it is. It's like showing off a wedding ring, saying this is the sign that I'm married to her and committed to her and have made a covenant with her, but I've got somebody else. Like, I've got a couple other people. That would be ridiculous to us. We'd say, who in the world would be actively living an adulterous lifestyle and bragging and boasting about this. That's what they were doing. That's no different than going through baptizing, claiming to the whole world, look at me, I'm a Christian, and then living a life that goes against God's word. Let's run through 26 and 27. Paul writes says, So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. Now that's a lot put in there. But what he's saying is if you're circumcised but you don't keep the law, you don't really follow after God, it's pointless and it's useless. And not just that, but it's actually regarded as worse, as bad. Why? Think about it. Think about how God's name, it said earlier, is blasphemed because of the way they live. It makes God look bad. You destroy your testimony when you claim something and live another way. Think of how belittling that would be if I boasted about this ring and then told people, like, no, I've got someone else. I'm cheating on my wife right now. They would say, well, that's useless. They wouldn't just think, like, oh, that's something you did. But they would have a very negative view of me and what I'm doing. Rightfully so, Right? You can't boast about something and do something opposite. Verse 28 and 29, he says, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. One of my favorite quotes is by a guy that I told you about the other week, R.C. Sproul. He says, it's not the profession of faith that saves, but rather the possession of faith. Y'all catch that? It's not the profession of faith that saves. You hear that a lot. If you profess Christ, you're saved. He says, not the profession, rather the possession of faith is what saves. You have to actually possess. You have to have that faith. Look, let me... I know we're running a little bit late tonight, but let me wrap it up by talking about this. We talked the other week, two weeks ago, about sexual immorality. And as I said, I understand this is a hot topic, and and this may seem somewhat related, maybe not all the way. We talked about same-sex marriage. We talked about, about gay marriage, about lesbian, lesbianism. We talked about all those things, even sexual immorality as a whole. But you know there's something we didn't discuss, and uh, that is this whole movement of transgenderism. All right, now, I'm not going to go off ranting and raving about it. Uh, To be perfectly honest, it doesn't matter what you think or feel about it. It doesn't, this is something kind of independent of that. But people who say, people who are born one gender and say, no, I'm really supposed to be another gender. I'm supposed to be something totally different than what God made me to be. All right, and I'm not talking about Klonfelder syndrome. That's extremely, extremely rare. But we are male or female. Listen, you can do what you want with me. I could put a dress on. Now, I'd make an ugly girl. I get it. I got too much hair and stuff, an Adam's apple. I don't have a very flattering build, a ladylike build, I guess. Uh, but you could put a dress on me. You could shave me really clean, put a wig. You could put makeup on me. You could dress me up, make me look just like a girl, and, and maybe I could pass as an ugly-looking girl and get away with it, Right? There are a lot of people do it. I've, I've seen some that I thought, mm, you may need to rethink your, your decision there. But you could do that, right? Especially in today's society. We actually think that's a good thing. And it's, it's crazy, especially among girls, how that spreads. If you ever look at it through the nation, it's crazy how, how much you're influenced by others around you. But, 
But here's, here's the interesting thing. Despite how I live my life, despite what I wear, despite what pronouns I want to use or whatever, and despite the surgeries, I'm sure you all have heard about them, you know what I'm talking about. They simply refer to them as top and bottom surgeries. You can have all that done you want. If I die and am buried, archaeologists, scientists can dig my bones up a thousand years from now, and you know what they know? That I was a male. I ain't no girl. You can simply look at bones, and you can tell what came from a male, what came from a female. Not just from density, but from size, mass of the certain bones and all that. And you can know without a doubt We can dig up skeletons from 2,500 years ago and tell that was a guy or that was a girl. You know why? Despite what you do on the outside, if it doesn't match what's on the inside, you will be found out. That's what God is telling them in short. I don't care what you do on the outside. Forget the dressing like a girl or a boy if you are a girl. You can come to church. You can come to youth camp. You can read your Bible when you go home. If you have not been changed on the inside, if you have not realized that God is a holy God and I will have to stand before him one day, but that loving God, that holy and just God that I'm going to have to stand before, he sent his son to die for me despite all of my sin. And if I trust wholly in him, if I repent of that sin, acknowledge that I've sinned, repent of it and trust in him, I can be saved. If you haven't done that and you haven't truly been changed on the inside, you will be found out and you will fulfill Matthew 7, 22 and 23. Many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, like in my little analogy, you're not a girl, you're, you're a boy, you're a dude. Clearly, I know what's on the inside. And with us, despite church attendance or anything, he's going to say, I know whether or not you are changed on the inside. So I want to leave you and encourage you, don't be fooled and don't be fake. Don't trust in the things you've done or the places you've been or who you run with. And don't be blind to the realities that if your heart has not been transformed by the gospel, you will pay for your sins when you stand before your maker. Examine yourselves and make sure that you have repented of your sins and place your faith in Christ for salvation. Let's pray. And I know we're a little bit short, but uh, we'll go to small groups for a few minutes when we wrap up. Let's pray.